Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Park Art Center. It's good to see you again, and we have a nice, wonderful program tonight. Everybody has experienced our Vivian Meyer exhibit, and also um, our series of movies that we had, Vivian Meyer Mystery. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our two guest speakers tonight, and um, it's a pleasure uh, to have them here at the Art Center. First of all, I'd like to introduce Frank Jackowick. Uh, he's a College of DuPage professor, lab instructor, and everything. <laughs> and he um, basically was the person who organized a team of students to tackle the development of brittle <laughs> uh, Vivian Meyer and Develop film that's over 40 years old in color. And our next panelist speaker, I'd like to introduce Sandy Stein Becker. And she's a professional photographer over 25 years, and she has vast experience uh, with making um, films, a documentary films. And she collaborated with Ron Gordon and Jeff Goldstein uh, on the collection. And she had the um, very precious assignment of developing Vivian Meyer uh, prints and silver gelatin. And with that, um, take it away. Hi. Oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. I can uh, to Park Art Center co-founder and Paulina Jimenez, who is operating our live video stream controls. Thank you. Um, I think um, we'd like to just mention that uh, questions are welcome anytime. Um, we like to kind of know what you're interested in. We both have a lot of information about photography and developing film and printing film and all the processes and the stories that went along with this project. So uh, it's nice to hear what you're interested in so we can answer the questions that you have. Um, I think Frank might get started because uh, he and his team were involved with the film processing. Ron Gordon and I were involved with the printing of the images. Um, so processing comes first. You know, and I wasn't nervous until that second. <laughs> <laughs> I was completely fine, and all of a sudden, I was like, uh, so I'm Frank Jackowick, uh, and really the whole project, uh, and even talking to Wendy, getting the thing, the exhibit here, it all seems like it's kind of a happenstance of events. You know, it's something to something to something, and what happened was, uh, I was going to visit a friend of mine, uh, Paul Natkin, who is a rock and roll photographer, you know, put him in a Google search, he's toured with the Rolling Stones, all this, and, and uh, I went over to meet him for lunch, and he said, sit down here, I want you to see something. So I sat down and he played me the WTTW Phil Ponce thing about Vivian Meyer. So I got done and I said, oh, that's really cool, what a great story. He goes, well, a guy that has the stuff is going to be here in about 10 minutes. So Jeff Goldstein came, he introduced me, and he said, I, I'm interested in having uh, some 120 film process. And, you know, I was instructor at the College of DuPage, a, a darkroom class, and I said, okay, I said, if you have it, I can do it this Saturday, you know, because I'm going to be at the school Saturday. And he said, well, I've got like a couple hundred rolls. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I could start Saturday. <laughs> and uh, so anyhow, from that, we figured out kind of a schedule, and I went to Jeff Goldstein's house, and he gave me the film. So I had about 200 rolls of mostly 120, some 35 millimeter film. And as I was walking to my truck, Jeff is behind me, and he says, how does it feel to have the priceless film? So I'm holding like the Rubbermaid, and like the thing where I'm nervous, I wasn't nervous like till that second, and I said, oh, yeah, feels great. And then I got in my truck, and it was right before Christmas, like the week before Christmas, and I was gonna stop at the mall on the way home, and I thought, I can't stop at the mall, I can't leave this in my car. And then I'm driving along and I'm like looking around, you know, traffic and different things and, you know, the conspiracy theory now is going through and I'm stopping for gas and I'm locking my car from the three feet that, you know. and then I got back in and took my jacket off and threw my jacket over the container and then when I got home, the same thing, I didn't know where to put it. I'm thinking, what if the house burns down or, you know, something happens, I should put it in a vault someplace. Uh, and I had called 
Jeff later and I said, yeah, thanks for throwing that out, the priceless film thing, because you know now I'm like 24 hour guard. Uh, uh, so through that kind of series of events, you know, I wound up getting the film. And like I said, it was right before Christmas. Uh, and I was trying to figure out how to put, get this in motion. And the thing that I had probably the least experience with uh, was processing 120 film. I processed it and, you know, probably did hundreds of rolls. But there was some 35 millimeter film in there, which I'm completely comfortable with. So uh, it was New Year's Eve. I went to the school. And in the quiet of the evening there, you know, I processed the 35 millimeter film and, you know, sat down uh, at the light table. And I, I should maybe back up. Uh, you know, the film was old. So I did a thing called a snip test where you snip, you know, part of the film and you process that. And, you know, the, one of the problems with that is when you snip that, you may snip a frame of film, you know, but that's the kind of the price. So I'd done the snip test and I snipped right between the frame lines. You know, and this is in the dark, you know, this is, you know, there's no way to see it. It's not there until the film is processed. So anyway, when I did that and I took it out, I said, man, how lucky did I get? It was like kind of an omen. I'm getting goosebumps not even thinking about that. I mean, I was really lucky. So I processed, got that film processed, and then sat at the light table. And then, you know, it kind of all hit me. It was like a surreal thing. Uh, you know, Vivian hadn't seen this film. You know, I'm like the only person in the world to see this film, you know, right now. And I'm thinking, there should be like a news crew, a fanfare. <laughs> You know, well, something. Then you wouldn't have been the only one that, seeing well, it. Yeah. But my my um, experience. Could, just, oh, but, sorry. Frank, is there anything different in in how you process an old old film? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> uh, there, there is, and that's part of the deal with the snip test. Uh, and I had done some research ahead of time and talked to some people. Who, and there's some additives you can put in the chemistry to help eliminate, you know, the thing you're fighting is fog. That's what generally is fog from light, light or fog from time. Time. Yeah. Years. Is, is years. that like a latent image? No, not really. It's it like exposure that's just sort of seeped into the so film. It's from time. Time, time. yep. Yeah. So that's what I was fighting, but uh, the way we conquered it for the 120 film was actually overdevelopment. So we developed it longer. And then, uh, you know, there's a fancy machine, a densitometer, and you can read densities and things. Uh, one of the things we did when we processed the film was we made like a test print just to kind of see how it printed, knowing that it was going to get printed eventually. You know, that was going to happen. What were you going to say, Sam? Oh, I was going to say that your um, experience was so much more uh, dramatic in certain ways because the film. You know, there's no going back once you've uh, processed it. So, you know, on our end, uh, uh, Ron Gordon and myself, who made all the um, the archival silver gelatin prints in the dark room, we didn't have that same pressure that Frank had just to make sure he didn't, you know, really totally mess up the film. <laughs> but his film um, did uh, end up printing fine. The film uh, negatives that we used were some that had been developed by Vivian Meyer. This was about 200 rolls that you did? We did 300, 300 rolls total. Yeah. And so we printed some of those images. Print up well, so you did a good job. And it's funny in the conversation that Sandy and I have had in even here, and what she said, she was kind of glad we were processing the film. I and the team were glad they were making the prints because, you know, that's what everybody's going to see, and, you know, the pressure was on her, so we yeah. kind of, it was a good... We did, we, we did, we sweated a lot because the first show that we did, well, I just want to talk about Ron Gordon for a minute as well. He's my colleague and friend. <laughs> He, uh, I'm a photographer, he's also a photographer, but we're both printers. He was a printer for 40 years, uh, and I worked with him for, I've been a printer for 25. So together, we made every single print together in the dark room 
you know, by hand, took hours, and then I retouched by hand every single print. So nothing was done, no digital repair. Um, it was just kind of a decision that Jeff Goldstein made to go and do it in the way that was, you know, for the kind of sensitive to the time. This was 120 film meant to be printed in the dark room. Now the thing is, these are all very nice digital prints on the walls, made by Frank. Um, it's the only set of prints digitally printed for the collection. Everything else was silver print in the dark room. Uh, editions of 15, this was made for a, a specific uh, purpose, so it's interesting that these are here. You're getting to see her images, but when uh, Wendy first contacted me, I thought, well, well, you know, I'm a silver printer, I'm a dark room printer, what am I going to really have to contribute here. But um, first of all, Frank and I have had some good conversations about kind of the, the importance of printing uh, in general. Like whether you print digitally or in the dark room, you know, printing is starting to, um, you know, lose its kind of, um, you know, importance in the world. People are looking at all their images on their phones and on their computers, and we are all really passionate about the print. The print is very important to look at your, your even your family, you know, images and holiday things. It's good to have prints up. And then for art, you really do need to look at it under a light, on a wall, and it's a whole different experience than looking at it, you know, on a screen. Um, so that's a little digression, but in any case, uh, Ron Gordon and I, we brought a lot of years of experience and we were still did feel a lot of pressure because people were looking at these all over the country and all over the world. They were going to New York and to Paris and to Poland and to China and to, you know, New Mexico and to, I mean, wherever they were going. And people were coming to galleries and coming to these places that normally didn't want to walk into a gallery because her work is so compelling and so interesting that everybody want, is drawn to it. I think you probably all agree. Um, so I digressed a little. That's okay. Um, Maybe I should, uh, the reason that these prints are here, and if you're a hipster and with the times there's a Chicago band, Wilco, Jeff Tweedy, Pat Sansone, people are kind of nodding their heads. Uh, they were somehow online and found Vivian Meyer on there and they really liked it and they got in touch with Jeff and said, we, we want to do something. And this was kind of early, you know, kind of at the beginning and they were playing a concert on the East Coast and they wanted to display some prints and Jeff said okay and they said well you know it's in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Ron and I were just starting to print I think the first show so we didn't have anything and so the decision was made to make the digital prints and then uh, and Sandy and I were talking about this right before we started you know I'm printing these digitally, trying to make them look as close as I can to what she's going to be doing, the silver gelatin print. And, you know, I'm an old film guy. I built my dark room uh, when I was in the sixth grade. So, like, I'm a staunch, you know, film guy. But it's one of those things where you have the technology available. You know, you want to write a book, you could still do it on a typewriter, but I doubt most people do that. You know, there's some technological advances. You know, for me, it's spell check. But uh, so we were able to have the show by printing them digitally. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been a show. So, you know, there's a few thousand people, uh, maybe slightly different age group, that got to see the prints that never would have. But uh, you know, this being the only collection that's printed digitally really makes them unique. And I think having Sandy and I here, and we, I joked, you know, the Clash of the Titans, you know, we're gonna arm wrestle over which is better. <laughs> we, no we both, yeah, yeah. Right, she's got me by, you know, the, the silver, silver gel, here you go. Uh, but, you know, that's how it exists. And uh, we agree, you know, talking about darkroom things, I tell, photography students all the time, if I could give you any tip to make you a better photographer, it would be taking a film class where you develop film and make a print. They say, oh, you can't, you know. And I'll say, when you get done, even if you never shoot film again, 
you'll be a better digital printer because having that tactile experience of the wet print and looking at the contrast and paying a little dues by making three or four or five, six prints and getting it exactly right will hone your skills to make you a much better printer in the, like the real world. In the digital world. In yes. the digital world. If you're going to exist in the digital world. Yeah, more question? Uh, well, you talked about him having the high stakes situation, and right, when you develop film, it's developed, it's, it's done. But um, printing is an art, you know, itself, and yeah, I didn't is want that, that high stress too? I, because I, you yeah. have to make those decisions. I mean, even whether you're going to go, every print I've seen is glossy and not matte. Like, all of those choices are right, being made by right. you so, and not by. Really yeah, I would love to just talk for a second about uh, some of the decisions that were made both by Jeff. Uh, you know, for the project as a whole, and by Ron and myself. And so um, Jeff uh, made a decision to uh, do silver gelatin prints uh, in editions of 15. Um, that's a pretty small edition when you think about it. He, uh, they were classic um, 12 by 12 square image size on a 16 by 20 paper, processed to museum standards. Um, so that's the kind of technical part of it, and then uh, retouched each print by hand by me. Uh, pretty much um, every print needed dust, scratches. Um, that's the stuff you can do on the computer now that seems pretty easy, but I did it under a light with a little brush <laughs> and a little dye. Um, some of the decisions that we made were based on the way this um, that she shot. So she shot, you might know, she shot uh, incredibly well. Her sense of composition, her uh, sense of timing, and how she waited for, for images. playing on the beach and she's kind of in a cement pipe or something and the way there's like a shadow a highlight of a or shadow of a cross on along her face mm -hmm. and at first we didn't even see her face in there like it took time to sometimes always see everything that was in the in the image the see, I didn't have to worry about any of this. <laughs> she, that's <laughs> all I heard. And I, I just kind of was sitting back. And, and it was it. hours. I mean, I think I mentioned to you, Wendy, that it would take, um, you know, we can only do about three images in a day because they were long, lots of manipulations. If whoever's been in a dark room knows that you have to, you know, burn and dodge. And there are a lot, a lot of you know, working on the print to make it uh, good. And then, like Frank said, the pressure of knowing people were seeing her work, you know, anywhere. And we, we, we had to make it as good as possible. Well, Sandy. the face of Vivian Meyer is really Sandy and Ron's and Ron, printing. Yeah. You know, that's the, that's the worldwide face of, of Vivian Meyer. Sandy, did you, did you do any cropping? Of no, that's a great question. Uh, no cropping, so all of these are completely full frame, you know, just pulled in over the edge to create a, a sharp edge. Um, and when I say manipulation, it's just really classic dark room work, uh, making some dark areas uh, lighter so you can see what's happening in the shadow areas and bringing down highlights so they don't just like fly off the, the page and frame. Um, just making the most you know beautiful print uh, possible, but you know think about we didn't have 
you know, are usually when you print for other people, you have a, a client or, you know, a friend that you're printing mm -hmm. for. But we um, not only didn't have her there to tell us, but also the, the prints that she did have in her collection were, were mostly prints that were probably made at a, maybe a drugstore or a photo place. I mean, she, I'm sure she knew what good prints looked like, but she didn't spend a lot of time um, printing her images. In fact, she didn't have proof sheets. Um, she just developed a lot of the film in her own bathroom, dark room, or had somebody develop the film. And then, obviously, there were a lot of there was a lot of film left over, both in in Jeff's collection and also John Malouf's collection. He he still has undeveloped film. Wow. Frank, oh, excuse me. How did you assemble your team of students at College of Jupiter? Oh, good good question. Uh, so, like I said, I had. Uh, expertise in 35 millimeter I was comfortable in doing that and there wasn't many I think there was maybe a dozen rolls of 35 millimeter and then what I did was we have a uh, what we call our photo list at school which is an email list that goes to current students former students anybody that wants to get on the list uh, if you guys go to cod.edu slash photo it'll say get on the list there's a link there to Google group so I sent that out and uh, I got a, a few responses back and you know I needed to have somebody that had some experience doing this because it's you, you know, know I developed a lot of them to film that, right? <laughs> <Did> you? <laughs> you didn't? Uh, well this was so early you know this this was so early I didn't know you then. right we, uh, it wasn't even that wasn't even I think in the thought process right. the thought process was trying to get the film developed uh, so I put out that email and I had a few people respond and then I had a current student uh, that I knew had processed 120 film before and I asked him that's Tom Dietz I, I mentioned him somewhere in, on the internet uh, and then I had another person respond and I said well when was the last time you processed any 120 film and he said well I did 10 rolls at home over the weekend so I said okay this guy is you know and uh, so I had from those responses, I've got, I had former students uh, that were working on processing. I had current students that were working on processing. Uh, I had a couple people that came in and uh, one person called, one person came in and said, I know nothing about photography. I can't process any film. I can't help you there, but I'm a very good organizer. Guess what? You're in. <laughs> because the film had a, you know, you had to keep track of the film and a local camera store, um, and I hate to say mom and pop, but it is a mom and pop and there's not too many of those left, is on straight up Roosevelt Road, it's PJ's camera. Uh, they're in the plaza where Trader Joe's is, or for the rest of you where Benny's is. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find it pretty easily there, but uh, when I was telling them what I was doing, I said I need to figure out how to keep the film, you know, numbered or do something. And they have a thing that they use in their lab. It's called Twin Check. You know, it's a stickers that are the same number. So they gave me a whole roll of stickers, and you know, so we twin uh, twin check everything. So the film that was in the canisters all got numbered, and then we printed contact sheets, and the contact sheets all followed with that number and then those negatives went into sleeves and these went next to them and uh, so the students worked basically they worked every Saturday I was there teaching class on Saturday uh, so 8 to 5 o'clock on Saturday they'd come in and we had uh, people load the film so we'd have it ready to go and then people would come in and they'd say I can be here for a couple hours they'd process some roles and uh, just to add to their fun, I would walk through while they were processing and they'd be agitating the tank. And I'd walk through really quickly and go, priceless film, no pressure. And, I'd, you know, <laughs> and their perk was when they got done processing, they were the only one that was allowed to see the film that they processed. They got to take it to the light table, sit down and look at the images. And then if they wanted to make a test print, you know, something similar to this, they could make a test print, take a look at it. And I'd have photo class 
uh, going on that day, and I hadn't even seen the stuff yet. And I would walk down to the photo class and I'd say, okay, you guys can be second in the world to come down and see, you know, these images. And they were black and white students, you know, they were processing black and white film, so they were hip to all that. So they got to come down and see it. And, you know, it worked at many levels. The reward, you know, for the job well done is having done it. But this so, so much surpassed that. Uh, because the students were talking it up, and uh, I went, uh, my son was living in Cleveland, and there was a little place he told me about that rents a dark room, and they have Polaroid cameras and stuff, and we went in there, and the guy's talking behind the counter about something, and he goes, I got to get to Chicago, because they're putting this Vivian Meyer <laughs> exhibit, I want to see that. So, Tell me what you know about Vivian uh -huh. Meyer. <laughs> and then... I told him the story about the film, and he was like bumping this guy next to him, thinking I was BSing him, you know. So the guy went and like Googled something and found my name someplace, and then came back and said, "No, he's on your level." <laughs> so he wound up coming. They did a road trip in and uh, saw the exhibit, and then got to meet Jeff. And you probably met him in some. But you know there are travelers from Cleveland, so so far that all this stuff stretched when it was going. You know, you never you never know where any of that stuff will go. But it influenced a lot of students, photographers. Some of the assignments that they did, or an assignment is you emulate a photographer that you like. And there's been a bunch of students, you know, that have done that. I have one student in particular that refuses to shoot anything digital. She doesn't shoot with the Rolleiflex, but she shoots strictly film with the Hasselblad. And one of the reasons was she was inspired by Vivian Meyer. So without having that connection, you know, you never know what would happen. So. Sandy, could you give us in more detail of how, why it's so important to know um, the printing process as to now of digital age? Um, so, you know, um, basically digital photography is, you know, born from uh, wet darkroom photography and film. Um, so, you know, everything we do digitally, and I do shoot digitally, and I uh, also am a digital printer as well, um, everything we do is based on the kind of foundations created by very simple, very basic um, film photography and it's really been around you know kind of stayed almost the same for years and years and years until digital photography was you know became the norm um, I think it gives you know Frank mentioned that um, becoming you know spending some time in the darkroom can make you a better digital printer and a better photographer um, and spending some time either looking at prints or making prints, going in a dark room yourself, uh, first of all, if you've never been in a dark room, uh, it's a great experience. And how many people have been in a dark room? So a good, yeah. goodly amount. Well. Yeah, so you know, you've experienced that moment when you first go in and you first put a print in the developer. You know, everybody says it's, it's like magic, you know? And, um, and then just take that, you know, and stretch it kind of it has a lot of ripples. So there's a, a reason why um, understanding printing does make really everybody a better photographer, even if you're just documenting your own family life and your, um, you know, your vacations, whatever. I mean, you, everybody is influenced by images that they see. And um, again, I mentioned that I really believe that prints are important. Um, one reason is because it is really a very a traditional and really important art form, or has always wanted to be. I mean, photography kind of has a history of being the, the underdog in the right. art world, exactly. you know, um, maybe not being considered an art form for a long time. But um, I think uh, when you have a sort of a, a doorway, an introduction to photography, like somebody like Vivian Meyer, it's really, it's really easy to go and just, you know, want to know all about her and what she did um, and how she got what she got. As photographers, we look a at a lot of her images and think, how did she get that? How did she get that? I mean, she has what people call a really great hit rate, you know, because she shot maybe a roll of film a day, approximately, 
uh, 12 images on the roll. And so think about how many pictures you take you know, at a time. You might take 50 of the same one. But she took one, and um, maybe two of the same scene, but one picture. So her roll of film would be 12 pictures, would be her whole day. And she traveled. I mean, she took the train into the city. She walked up and down Madison Street. She went to the west side after the riots and photographed, got off the bus and photographed. And but everything she did, she was very judicious in her, in her shooting. She wasn't uh, shooting the way we shoot now, digital images. <coughs> I think over, we overshoot. And a lot of times, I don't know, would you agree, some of the stuff is mundane, mm -hmm. and it, it didn't seem important probably at the time, but somehow it was important to her. And then when you look at the photograph, now it's important to you. And that was one of the things that I thought was, I would probably never shoot this picture. You know, I would walk, walk right past, so, you know, that kind of taught me. But, yeah, I, I, I think one of the things about her is that she shot, she didn't really shoot the decisive moment that was very kind of important at the time, right. you know, the more dramatic moments. Her, her moments were, you know, universal life moments. They're just things that happen and sights you come upon during your, during your day. And she was just a really great at, you know, getting those moments and and you know highlighting them, making the, those very artistic and and I think that people connect with those. People connect with her images because they're so universal. I mean, I, so many of these pictures could be on your walk, you know, or I mean, they do have that historical significance too. But it, I think it's more than just nostalgia that makes her so interesting to people, so popular. I think every person that looks has some type of connection when they look at the photographs, you know, and that connection, you know, that kind of artist to artist connection by just looking at her photographs, you know, is what drove that appeal. You know, it's a cool story and everything, but the images have to be there to substantiate that. So I think we got dueling questions here. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so. I spent a very little time digital printmaking, and um, it's hard. It's really hard to translate a digital image to paper. It is difficult. Um, so really? I had never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so with that in mind, I was just wondering what kind of frustrations and intricacies are involved in translating uh, images mm -hmm. that you know probably no one ever dreamed of being digital in that way. Uh, Myers work or really any work that um, was born at the time when digital printmaking wasn't a thing. Like, is that so? Are, are you asking um, about these digital prints or about the prints in the dark room? Um, I'm just at, asking, like, about printing in general. I'm asking about the conversation yeah. between digital and oh, um, okay. traditional printing, especially when you start thinking about technology changes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, do, it does. Um, you want to start? Sure. Right. Uh, I have some thoughts. You know, and, and these prints, uh, like I mentioned, you know, I'm trying to print it like Sandy and Ron would print it. I'm trying to do that because that's the best look I have in my head for, you know, because I'm a film guy, that's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I'll go out kind of on a limb and say, these aren't quite as good as the silver gelatin version would be. <laughs> and I think knowing the story behind it where, you know, they got printed to the best they can be, you know, that, that was my goal, to print them the best they can be. But for me, there's a depth, uh, almost uh, an own life thing to a silver gelatin print that doesn't kind of translate digitally. But if you're striving for that, I think you're going to get the best print you can and represent the print the best way you can. Uh, and it's hard, it's harder for me on a monitor to judge it. I almost have to print and look at that print and then go back and, you know, print. So I'm judging the printed thing, not so much the monitor. Um, I'll just add, add to that. Um, Maybe what you're talking about with frustrations is just 
it is hard. You know, it's, I, I, I'll call it challenging, not hard. Um, there, you know, I mean, we spent a lot of hours, and these are, you know, Ron and myself had a lot of years of printing, and these were the most challenging prints we ever made, either of us. And he, I mean, he's 40 years of printing, you know, and an incredibly talented guy. And you, you know, you talk about the printing, and, you know, in some text, it'll say master printer, right? And when I see that, I say, that doesn't even cover it. They're, they're notches above, you know, the master, the master printer. I mean, for not having the client and trying to have to figure that out. I mean, think of you poor guys. I didn't have to, any of that thought process. The thing I just uh, processed the film done, but you know, yeah. it, there's a lot of decisions. But I'll just say, there's really no substitute. I think when you're doing anything in any art form, especially, there's no substitute for time. And so I. You know, I when I was starting out, I had those frustrations of test strips and things not going well, and you spend hours doing something and it doesn't come out quite right. But I think the more you look at prints and then the more you just do it, you know, you just get you just get better at it. And uh, these were special in so many ways because first of all, no one was had seen you know these kind of prints. Um, she hadn't had you know large prints made, so. You know, it was kind of a special circumstance. And then another thing I want to talk about uh, really briefly is uh, having like a, um, I think Ron and myself, we had a really interesting work partnership. It's really, you know, the darkroom is kind of a small place. And you can't, you know, be in there all day with someone who you don't work well with. And it's mm -hmm. just really tricky. Um, and I think it was a really interesting collaboration to have us both working on every print. We would take turns, you know, at the enlarger, or at the chemi chemicals, and um, anyway, I think that it kind of brought another a, a level of difference to the Vivian Meyer printing. And then the other thing is that uh, we're all um, Chicago people, and so Vivian Meyer spent so much time in Chicago, and it was it was important to Jeff, you know, to have all this team of people with just very Chicago-centric, with the sensibility of having lived here and walked the streets and, and everybody the work kind ethic. Of clicked. Everybody kind of clicked that yeah. was working on things. And I'm 100% I'm sure that if it wasn't you guys printing, they wouldn't be as good as because of the collaboration, because of what you're saying, working in the dark room and all that, that Chicago connection. If it was somebody from outside or it was somebody else, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as nice. Frank, did Vivian have a favorite film? You know, the type of black and white. Not really. She she shot a lot of uh, like Pan X or you know that that type. There was some film that didn't have any markings on it, and you know back then there was really like no 400 speed film, and some of the film wasn't marked, but it was it was mostly. Uh, Kodak, there was some, like, I think just a couple rolls of Agfa or something like that, but it was mostly Kodak. What, uh, what kind of condition was that film in after so many years? You know, surprisingly, it was kind of okay. <coughs> you know, it, was, it wasn't real brittle. Uh, and and as Sandy mentioned it, uh, the, the fog, fog from age, you know, is what you suspect, you suspect and, and, you know, that's, that's what it was. was. Uh, one, one of the, the other kind of interesting things was she had written some notes on the film, and some of it was written in French. You know, so you know there'd be something written on there like "lousy guy" something, and then you know there'd be something in French, and Jeff actually had somebody you know translate and did whatever, and he preserved all that. You know that there's a paper that comes with that film, and you know. I couldn't see throwing that away, even though it was basically useless. You know, I, even the part that was written on, I kept everything else because it was kind of unique. So, but the film, surprisingly enough, was okay. And Same thing with the, the negatives that were already processed. I thought they were in, in really terrific condition. Um, very little damage. I mean, there was a lot of dust and, and that kind of thing on the negatives. So we didn't. 
wash. We didn't do anything to the negatives. We didn't know how they were processed, how they were fixed, how they were washed. So we didn't do anything to the negatives, the ones that were uh, processed by her. But they were surprisingly in really good shape and you know, almost everything very printable. Yes. Uh, one of the things you said, I mean, early on, is you said you were working on New Year's Eve. What year? This would have been uh, now probably four years ago. Uh, 2011. This is very oh, 2011. Oh, no, so it would have been 2010. It would have been 2010. 2010. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, so it's been, it's been quite a while. And at the beginning there, you know, her name wasn't really out there. You could find some information, but it wasn't like it was, let's say, in 2014. That was kind of everywhere. Did you have a question? I did. Uh, one of my favorite words about photography is photopsychometrics. Has anyone looked at her photographs to make an, a psychological profile of who she was? I'm intrigued by the person. Uh, when you look at the photographs, I kind of get a part of who she was. I think her psychodynamics was unusual. Will be more written about that part of who she was. Well, there, I mean, there's a lot written already, and there's some more people working on books about her. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that, only because uh, I'm really here more for the, for the printing. I mean, I think everything that Frank or I could say other than the facts of where she was born and where she lived would be speculation. I do have one kind of thing, and uh, Inger, mm -hmm. uh, and you might know her, she's from the, movie. from the movies, Philip the Womet. Uh, and again, this far-reaching stuff, I'm in an old Buick club, you know, mm -hmm. hot rod racers, and one of the racers uh, one of the, we were at the drag strip, and he said, tell me about Vivian Meyer. I'm like, what? You know, we're at the racetrack, that's the last thing you expect. And I told him we processed the film and everything. He goes, Inger was my next door neighbor. So said, I used to go to the beach when they went to the beach, you know, Vivian would go. And I asked him, I said, what would you think of her? He said, well, she had kind of a unique personality. And you knew when she wanted to do something, you had to do it because if you didn't do what she said, the next time you didn't get to go. And I thought, all right. So she was kind of a direct, you know, person. And you know, I could. There are a lot of stories about interactions with her. Um, you know, some of them are chronicled in uh, the documentary that uh, John Maloof made called um, "Finding Vivian Meyer." And then there's another documentary that's based on Jeff Goldstein's collection, and um, that which is this collection. And that one um, is kind of more about her. Um, it's done by the BBC. But again, there are people being interviewed who knew her, who either um, children who spent time with her. And I think you can try to get a picture of her through that. Um, so I hesitate to you know, use any particular descriptions. But I mean, you can. there are a lot of stories out there. Obviously, um, one thing I would say is that she was very um, just so committed to photography because she documented, you know, basically her whole life. And at a very uh, regular, you know, like consistent rate. I mean, you know, back then to buy, to be, to not be a photographer and to shoot a roll of film a day in this camera, you know, and the cost of it and the cost of repairing her cameras. The people at Central Camera downtown they, they knew her because she was always in there repairing, they had to repair cameras her cameras, wear out. they would wear out. Wow. She was wearing out wow. her cameras because she was obsessed with shooting. And so, I mean, that's a real, a true artist who is so dedicated to their work and didn't, you know, show it to other people for the most part. Um, she probably knew she was good. I mean, I think she knew she was good. Um, but she didn't really seem to need to look at the work or have other people look at the work. But again, I don't know that. But anything we say about her as a person is really, you know, mostly speculation. And that's part of the story, I think, that makes it kind of cool, right. you know, that you didn't but really like, know. But, but like Frank said, it's the images that will really, that will, those will stand the test of time. The story is fascinating, but the images will really, right. they, will, they will be around.
Interesting. And I'd encourage you guys when we get done, um, you can go through these are the contact sheets. So you can kind of look and see what order she was shooting things in, and you know, if there's a rhyme or reason, and you can check the exposures, like Sandy said. Sometimes there's deep shadows and there's something else. Always. One of the guys from the team, uh, somebody was Tom Dietz, somebody said, you know, if you ever met Vivian Meyer, you know, what would you say? And he he says, get a better light meter. On <laughs> <laughs> her camera, it didn't have a light meter. Right. So right. she, she was, was shooting, you know, outside and changing light and changing circumstances. And she did a, a fantastic job. She did um, way better than I I could have. You know, one, one quick thing before uh, another question is that um, uh, we should mention that, you know, there's so many self-portraits. So, did, you know, I don't know if you've noticed mm -hmm. by looking at her work. And they are really uh, quite complicated. Some of them, you know, some of them are just her shadows, obviously. But some of the reflections that she did were really complicated. And I think shows that she has some kind of mathematical mind because... Some of them are reflections upon reflections. They're in corners where you might see some of the writing backwards and then some of the writing forwards. And you really have to look at the image to see and figure out where she was standing and what she was reflecting into. And they're just, some of them are really fantastic and some of them are really complicated and they're, you know, they require a lot of time looking at them to figure out what she was doing. So it's really uh, interesting that whole her whole self-portrait movement. And then, you know, you could try to interpret, you know, why she did so many of those. Um, but she just, you know, so prolific, over 120,000 negatives. You know, I mean, what a life. When it costs money, you know, every time you push that button, it costs money. And it seemed like, you know, that was secondary to her. She was just shooting. She didn't care about that. It was that important. But we have a couple of questions. I was wondering about the ownership question. When we got the film, um, who was the actual owner of the of the film that you processed and put out for the public to see? Well, there are 200 rolls of film, basically 120 film with some 35 millimeter that was owned by Jeff Goldstein. So he bought that. And then there was another 100 rolls of film that were joint owned by Jeff Goldstein and John Maloof, who was another person, you know, from the collection. And, you know, it's been in the news and all that, and, you know, the actual physical film can be bought, sold, whatever, it, you know, it's the copyright, you know, that's been the dispute, and, you know, kind of been like the monkey wrench. And I, I feel sorry for the art world that that happened, you know, but the actual film itself, there's no, there's no doubt about the ownership you know, it was bought at, like you watch Storage Wars, it was bought at a, mostly bought at a storage auction. Mm -hmm. So those are two separate collections, by the way, like um, John Maloof had the, has the uh, larger collection of about 100,000 negatives, and Jeff Goldstein, who we worked, all worked with, uh, his collection was about 20,000 negatives, and he did, as Frank said, you do, you own the materials, but it's the copyright that, and the ability to publish and sell work is, is what's un, you know, under contention. We have a question for Sandy. Uh, how long does it take to print one in Selvagella to print? How long? How many hours? Um, so I think we figured out um, between this, you know, setup and the printing and then the washing and drying and the retouching, it might be uh, close to a full day for one print. Whoa. Um, and, you know, it goes in stages because you're, you know, printing and then you're washing a batch and they have to dry overnight and they have to be pressed, you know, and then uh, later on, I think maybe when we're off air or whatever, we'll, we can look at some uh, samples that I brought of the retouching um, so you can kind of see the dramatic nature of, of why we did it the way we did it. Um, but maybe a whole day for a print. When you, when you factor yeah. into all in, all the different, well, print. yeah. Well, so we would print uh, maybe four or five prints of one image at a time. We never printed fifteen at a time. Uh, we printed, uh, although the editions went to fifteen, we we printed you know kind of in, in smaller batches. We might make three images in a day. 
in the dark room, but then there's still the, the washing and the drying and the retouching. How, how were the... Uh, oh, we have a... We haven't heard from them. So, I can see their contact sheets and one there, even from this distance, it looks like the contrast is in the sharp, and I know very little about photography. Um, but also they're considerably smaller. So looking at those, how did you decide to what what size to enlarge them to and print them to? Well, this, the size was set. We printed everything at 12 by 12 inches square on a 16 by 20 sheet of paper. So the photo paper comes you know, in certain sizes. And so 16 by 20 was the size. And 12 by 12, and what are these? Are these like 10, 8, yeah. something like that? These might be. These are 10, I think. These look like 9 or 10 inch squares. So we printed 12 inch square. And it was just a standard, and we did, you know, uncropped, full frame. So it was just a standard. It wasn't. We didn't a change judgment for that. You felt that was oh, the size was, was not a judgment. No, they all had to be the, that size, except for uh, different. There were some different size negatives. Uh, there were some uh, rectangular negatives that she shot early on in France. She used a box camera before she moved to that, and they. Um, they produce negatives that are about uh, six by seven. Is that what the mm -hmm. centimeters? Anyway, they um, <laughs> they uh, they were larger because we had to adjust for and for thirty five millimeter, we adjusted. So for contrast, wouldn't it be interesting to do a photo exhibit on Trump's hair? <laughs> 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 you yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <clears throat> yes. Uh, it seems to me these days that uh, digital photography is largely crowding out uh, uh, film photography in its base market. And I'm wondering, is that true? And if so, what does that portend as far as the, as far as the market for digital processing versus traditional processing? I'm hoping it's a fad. Because <laughs> <laughs> you want to go ahead and uh, answer it, yep. um, Well, it's all true what you say. Uh, there's, uh, for instance, there's really only one kind of paper, one manufacturer making darkroom paper. Ilford um, can't get chemicals at the store anymore. You have to order everything. So it's, you know, shrink. The ability to do it is um, shrinking. And the people who can do it and want to do it also shrinking, but there is kind of a movement. There's young people who want to learn how to process film and make a print, and there are all kinds of photo communities all over the country. I mean, we went to a few of them, and we were really happy to see, like in Minneapolis, they have a photo center, and they've got it's thriving, and people are taking darkroom classes there. So I think there's a bit of a movement uh, to kind of hang on to a, a, like a craft that's important and beautiful, um, but is it mainstream anymore? No. I mean, I don't think people, when they're shooting, they're, they're going to shoot digitally mostly, unless they have a, find a special connection to, to film and darkroom printing. And speaking um, of classes, oh yeah, at the College of DuPage, you know, oh, which is straight up Roosevelt Road, <laughs> uh, you know, we still teach a darkroom class there, so you process film, you make prints, but that has shrunk. It used to be a morning, afternoon, and night class. Saturday and Sunday, the darkroom was open. You know, that's gone down to like one class a semester, sometimes two, but you can almost look at, or some people look at the darkroom class like a crafting class, like you take a pottery class or you take a painting class, where before it was a necessity in photography, it's not, you know, I say it's kind of a luxury in photography, you know, because you're getting that extra expertise. But, you know, I'd encourage you, take, take a darkroom class. You know, it smells the same in the darkroom for you guys that are in there. And I've had people donate equipment to the school, an old film camera they'll never use. And I asked one of the guys that came in, he was there with his wife. I said, you got any old negatives at home? He goes, oh, I got boxes on them. I said, you know what? 
what day are you free next week? Bring in some of those negatives. And we went in the dark room, and he says, nothing's changed in here. And I said, what did you think? He said, well, I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, literally five minutes, I was out of there and left him and his wife, and he printed for four hours and made all these prints. And he's coming back in September. He's coming back to print some more. And, you know, he's not a student or anything. He's just a nice guy and, you know, thinks it's cool to be in the dark room. And, and There's nothing like being in the dark room. It's yeah. fantastic. It's a, you, and it does, you, you know, hours fly by and you're, you know, focused on making these uh, prints. And, uh, yeah, everybody should give it a try. I have Girl Scout troops come. They work for a merit badge. And I talk about photography and then I take them in the dark room and I let them each make a photogram. It's where you take photo paper and you put stuff on top and then you make an exposure. And, you know, for the kids it's great because it's wet, <laughs> you know, it's spilling stuff. And I tell them at the beginning, you can't get in any trouble here. You spill stuff, that's what, you know, the process. And, you know, they make something and they run out of time. They have to leave before they're bored, you know, which in this day and age I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. Sandy, if I'd go into a gallery, what's the likelihood that those would be digitally printed? Or are they still mainly dark room? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, it really depends. Uh, it will always say, uh, usually underneath, um, yeah, like this says archival inkjet. So it'll always say whether it's what material it is. Um, if you're in a museum, you know, and it probably will be a silver gelatin print. Um, I can tell a silver or gelatin print from a digital print pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time. How? Um, How? Uh, that's my secret. No. <laughs> Read the sign underneath. Uh, okay. <laughs> Read the sign. No, if there's no sign, I can, I can tell. Uh, it has to do with the surface of the print. I'm not, you know, I could explain it to you uh, actually when I show you some silver gelatin prints, but you know, it maybe takes a little while to get to that level. But I think if you're, if it's a um, art gallery that is, you know, showing work that, um, you know, is, I hate to say the word serious, because there's plenty of, there's great digital prints. I mean, I, I print digitally myself, and I enjoy it. I don't enjoy it in the same way, and I still think, you know, even Frank said that silver prints are, they're just, they have like a texture and a depth. Um, and a feel to them that I can't, you know, uh, describe in any other way that that digital might not have. But the digital is good and it's sharp and it can be very, you know, contrasty and you can kind of change, you can work and play with the warm, you know, warm, cool nature of it. Um, but really in the dark room you have a lot of kind of, you have a lot of creativity in there. Silver gelatin print is really unique, you know, especially now where there may be digital prints, but nobody's really gonna hide that. If you're at a gallery or something, it's gonna say silver gelatin print. Yeah. But I, I think, think collector is good. Yeah, for, for collecting. a collector, you know, that's that's what they want. That still has the value. And I, I guess I just wanna say, you know, that uh, give you know Jeff Goldstein some uh, props. He really he made a lot of decisions and they were very um, they just had a lot of integrity. He really tried to keep the whole everything that the project did in relation to Vivian Meyer is really high quality and, and kind of simple but great as possible. He also had um, like a partner in the office, Ann Zakaris, and she was is uh, very talented at you know kind of putting all the shows and what together. I mean, at one point they had like 12 or 13 different exhibitions out at different places, and I mean the kind of coordination that takes very small team of us doing this, all this work, and uh, really, um, you know, great, dedicated people, all of, all of us. It was really, a, you know, a unique experience, you know, one, uh, a once-in-a-lifetime thing for me, for sure. Well, you left a legacy for everybody to enjoy for years to come. Uh, it's really hers. Pioneers in, in this helped. fabulous collection. Yeah, I mean, definitely it's her, it's her vision, her work, beautiful. And, and like I think everybody's intrigued about Vivian, and plus the people in the pictures. There's so much more to be processed and 
print and expose, people are wondering, did she ever take a picture of me walking down the street? Or oh, is yeah. that my grandma over there? Or who are these people? There She's a mystery, and these people in the photos are a mystery too, except the children that she sat for. Was it Wilmette? Somebody that came to that show. Oh, a lot were, of people were, were in. in the, oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, they have found that, themselves. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I see there are about twenty-eight thousand negatives in this gold yeah. collection. Yes. Have all of them been printed? No. Okay. And what? And did you? How much did you? Um, I don't know. There's a huge issue, or not issue, but a really interesting part about uh, posthumous prints is right. that. It's not selected by the photographer, and that's right. so massive. Even in right. with film, you know, there's a massive reduction. Like you'll you'll shoot five thousand and only show fifty, right? So there's um, and that that shows who you are as an artist. So, um, what did you think about? And you and who else, whoever else was printing from those, what did you keep in mind about her life, her her style, and try to isolate? That's just a huge um, factor in. Right, and I think uh, Jeff has told, I've heard him tell about how, how they started out selecting prints. So uh, Frank mentioned Paul Natkin. He's a really well-known music photographer from Chicago, been shooting every kind of musician and band for 40 years. He was involved, uh, Jeff and I think Anne, I think they all started looking through the work. They took a they, contact sheet right. and they put a dot. They each had a different color dot. And all the ones that came out with three dots were, that was the beginning of, that was the first show. Um, so there were, you know, different sensibilities, you know, kind of selecting and editing them. But that's always going to be a controversy. Who is selecting? Who is editing? Who is choosing how she is represented in the world? And that it's, it is, you know, I agree that it's tricky. Um, I think in the printing aspect, so Ron and I did not select the photos, uh, images, we printed them. Um, and I think for us, we just tried to look at, you know, what is she, you know, what is she trying to say? What was she looking at? Who, you know, what is the reason for this picture? And then just try to make it as beautiful as possible. Mm -hmm. And the challenge, what about that feeling for you of deciding to uh, go darker to oh. do what? <laughs> you know, how do you... Well, I think you, you know, look what, you know, what is, what was she seeing? You know, what are, what do you, you know, what's the real, what's the story in each picture? You know, what, what is the story? And then you try to bring it, you know, try to make it, you know, easy for people to see, you know, and, and you know, if there's a lot of shadows, you're going to keep them, you know, dark, but you want to have enough in there to, you know, see in a little bit. And, you know, there's just a lot of decisions you make that most I just processed the film, so I didn't have to do it. <laughs> no decisions. We had a lot of decisions, but, you know, you just kind of use your experience and use, you know, what little we knew about her and, you know. Probably you experience as a photographer yourself. You yeah, know. that too, you know. I mean, I learned a lot about photography uh, from printing. I started out as a printer and then became a photographer. Some people start the other way around. But um, that, you know, my sensibility comes from really looking at a lot of prints. Didn't through pure osmosis you begin to think and see like she did? I don't, I, I, I don't think so, actually. I mean... That would be nice to think that, but... You haven't become a nanny, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I was a nanny. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we, we definitely got in a uh, kind of a rhythm, and I think it took a while. You know, the first set, you know, were good, but I think we really got in a rhythm about a year or two years in. Hmm. So maybe that is kind of what you mean. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of really got a feel for, we got more of a feel for, right. for her. Because you could work. never be her, but. Right. But, but well, we did talk to her a little. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had mentioned there's negatives from France that she had mm -hmm. taken. Um, is there also negatives from New York and other cities? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is, uh, of the 120,000, approximately how many are, you know, Chicago area related? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Do you? And Anybody? No, I, um, I guess. Okay. 
she lived here and you know was a nanny on the North Shore maybe over 20 years right maybe 25 30. years 30 so of that time those you know would be Chicago negatives Chicago images except for you know trips she took so the early ones there's she went back to France those are the kind of rectangular photos from the late 40s, sorry, I think around 1948, 50, early 50s, and she was in New York. So it kind of chronologically figure out where she was. She also took, um, lived here for a while and took a trip around the world. Uh, she was gone for quite a while. So there's pictures from uh, maybe Morocco and some places like that too. Yeah, Canada, um, New York definitely, a lot of New York photos. but the. You know, I would say from 50s, 60s, and 70s, a lot of Chicago. Is, is there an evolution in her skills and composition Definitely. abilities that you see in those? Um, so um, this book, I believe, is Rich Cahan and Mike Williams' mm -hmm. book. Um, and it, it kind of tells, there's a, you know, a lot of storytelling and history kind of in that book. Um, and they say that um, there's kind of a, an arc, you know, when she went to the Roloflex and then was shooting, it was, a, you know, a nanny and shooting almost every day. Um, her work was probably maybe at its best during those 20 years or so. And then um, this maybe things got a little tougher for her personally, you know, there was maybe more of an emphasis on kind of the darker darker aspects of life, you know, more photos of, you know, garbage and, you know, just things like that. So there was a kind of a, a noticing and an observation of what she was shooting, which times. But maybe to answer about her evolution, you know, that's, you know, that was kind of a professional camera. I mean, the Roly is, a, so if you know how to use that camera. It wasn't cheap. Yeah, if you know you how know, to use that, and she had a couple of them, if you know how to use that, you know, in the 50s, you're you're a good, you know, you're probably really paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I'd encourage you, uh, we'll leave this one here because it's somebody else's camera, but this is uh, mine, and it's broken, so you can't break it. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, great to look through it. And, you know, feel this, and, you know, 12 shots looking down. change the role of film so she really walked the streets though too mm -hmm. she just walked I have one more question before we, we wrap her up uh, for you Frank and uh, if you would like to mention anything about your personal experience developing the Vivian Meyer film that you haven't mentioned uh, probably th the biggest thing was that it was kind of a surreal experience that first time processing it and I knew I knew how important it was and uh, you know, kind of when I did it by myself, I probably almost had to do it by myself. Yeah. You know, it was probably good that it happened that way. And uh, I, I remember kind of at the end, you know, I, was, I spent New Year's Eve with Vivian, and I thought I was really lucky, you know, that this happened. I was really lucky because, you know, once in a lifetime, who gets that unique oh, experience, mm -hmm. you know, to have something like that happen, so. And uh, I know uh, out of that whole thing, she's changed me as a photographer. You know, I look at things differently. You know, and I think I described something that she took a picture of. You know, the kid does this gesture so much nobody even notices, but there's no picture of it. But she took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really changed me as a photographer. I want to say one thing about um, something that I, I, I noticed and that I think maybe Rich Cahan brought up at one of the t his talks and that is she kind of her work kind of taught me you know who who are we looking at who are we ignoring in the world you know she was kind of walked through the world and people you know didn't pay attention to her and people didn't you know people
talented people out there in the world and who you know who do we give our attention to you know we were you know there was Vivian and she was composing but also <coughs> kind of invisible as she walked through the world and here she was this great talent and um, I think it's kind of good to remember that there are people out there that you know may look different or you know as a woman she was you know pretty unique for, for that time there weren't a lot of women like her um, so it's probably somewhat ignored or um, you know, kind of uh, yeah, not really a not second really. thought, maybe. Yeah, know. and so, and she had a very compassionate eye. You know, she took pictures of people that other people passed by or that were, you know, down and out or children, you know. So she really uh, gave a kind of a visual voice to people who, you know, who other people didn't notice. Good uh, phrase, and that's, visual voice. That's a really uh, great um, lesson, I think, just kind of in life. And, and definitely, like Frank said, she Uh, do you need us to sit down? Uh, you can sit down. Okay. Um, so, one of her images, um, these are silver prints under here, and um, they are unretouched and then retouched. So I have two, two examples, two images, where we kept one un, unretouched, and you'll see when you look at it more closely, um, the unspotted one. Okay, so there's black scratches. There are, you know, hundreds of white dust spots here. Um, there's scratches going down this way. And so by hand, I um, took a yellow spotting brush that's archival dye that was made um, to go into, you know, at one time everybody knew how to do that. But again, it's one of those, it's just a skill that I have that people don't have because they don't do it. Um, but anyway, this particular image took me um, an hour and a half to two hours for one print to spot it all. Because you can't put it up on the wall if it's not. I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you should take a look at these. They're kind of fun. Um, yeah. Now, if I can ask, enough? if somebody were to want to use you for a print, you know, how much would you ordinarily charge just to not a full contract like this? But. I have to know later. about the project, yeah. Talk to your agent. Frank and I will, yeah. yeah. We, have, we talk to our people. <laughs> we can talk to you afterwards. But like Sandy said, there's very few people that, that have that talent right. anymore. And, uh, and I got a lot of uh, uh, spotting and etching. Oh, and etching is the... Um, what you do with a little exacto blade to take out the black spots or black scratches. It's really tricky. I got a lot of advice from um, a wonderful retoucher named Julia Ryan. Um, but so over the years of working on these, I just kind of got more and more involved and was able to do more involved retouching because it can't show. I mean, it cannot show. If it shows. But if you have an idea, you know, something you can. And I, and I know Keith from school, so maybe if you have an idea and you want to run it past, you know, you never know, right? Right, never know. So if you'd like, I mean, we could, you know, shut off the live stream and, right. you know, just answer look questions. through some of these things that you have here, for example, okay. so before and afters. Mm -hmm. Um, and some other things that you have. So. You can chat us up when yeah. we're done. Yeah. It's okay. So okay. Thank you but for thank your you. time yes. uh, for yes. this discussion. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you.